So now what we're going to do is we're going to turn our attention to looking at the various associative containers. And I think we'll start today with the, the ordered associative containers. And uh, we'll see how many we can get through. We might get lucky and be able to get through all of them in this uh, session. So what is the first one? The first one is kind of the, quote, easiest one. It's the set associative container. And we're going to focus on ordered set, which just has the very simple name set. So a set is an ordered collection of unique keys. So that could be whatever you need to have a set of. Maybe it's a set of student ID numbers or something like that, where, or you know, social security numbers, or um, Vanderbilt employee numbers, or you know, whatever it is that's going to be a unique value that won't have any duplicates. And uh, we're going to take a look at some examples that illustrate how to use a set in just a second. And keep in mind, of course, that sets have this funky property that their that iterators to the set will always treat the keys as consts, so you can't change them under the hood. So we'll start out by giving an overview of what is a set. So a set's a collection of ordered data that's stored internally in a balanced binary tree, which is implemented as a red-black tree, although that's just implementation detail. And the signature of the set class, it's a generic class, of course, it takes type name key, which is the set of types, and it takes a compare, functor, which defaults to less, and then it takes an allocator, which defaults to the standard allocator that uses operator new and delete. Key characteristics, characteristics of a set, it orders the elements that are added to it, because of course the tree is ordered, and there's only one copy of any element or key. So you can only have one copy. If you try to add another element, it's not going to let you add it, and it'll tell you that there's already a value in the set with that particular key and you can figure out whether you're trying to insert a duplicate for a set. Now, the sets, of course, like all the other containers, have iterators, and they will give them back to you in the order. So if it's ordered using the less operation, which is the default functor, comparison functor that's provided there, that'll come back in ascending order. If you use a different order operation, like the greater operation, then it'll come back to you in descending order when you iterate through it. And by default, it wants to use operator less than. And obviously, as I've mentioned before, that works great if you have sets of primitives or built-in types. But if you have user-defined types, you have to define operator less than. Otherwise, the compiler will squawk at you and refuse to compile your code because it says, hey, how can I order these things? I don't even know what the less than operation is. So let's take a look at an example that'll illustrate how sets can be used. So we're going to create a set of ints. and we're going to give it just you know a bunch of values. These are intentionally not ordered, so obviously it's going to be ordered. And let's change the name to set, oops, uh, set of ints. So we have a set of ints, two, one, three, zero, seven. And just for kicks, we're gonna give it the greater functor. So that means it's gonna be arranged in descending order when we iterate through it. The next thing we do is we go and we try to find the value nine in the set. And of course, under the hood, the find operation is going to use binary search. It's going to search through this red black tree to try to find the value nine. Now, if you look carefully, you can see that it will not find nine because nine is not a member of the set. So as a consequence, we're going to get back an index, which is really not so much an index. It's really, uh, let's change that name too. That's really an iterator. Let's call it iter, the iterator it gets back will of course actually equal set of ints end. So it'll point to the end iterator, in which case we're going to print out nine not found. Well, not wanting to be daunted for long, we're then going to go ahead and try to insert nine into the set of ints. So we're going to say insert nine, that's going to go into the set. And now we're going to print out the number of elements in the set and the set should have grown. It would have been five originally, now it should be six. And then for kicks, we use a generic find algorithm. And we'll talk about the difference between find, which is what we used up here, right there. We used the generic find algorithm originally. Oh, sorry, we used the, the uh, class-specific find algorithm here, and then we used the generic find algorithm here. And I'm doing this just to show you the difference. This would also make a great quiz question, by the way. So what generic find does is it starts at the beginning of the set of ints with the iterator, and it goes up to, but not including the end, iterator in the set of ints. So it takes that range and it looks for the value nine. And if we take a look at what the compiler is trying to tell us, it's trying to say, 
this STL call should be replaced with a container method. And let's see if it's smart enough to actually do that. And it is, that's pretty cool. Now, why is it trying to tell us that? Well, the reason it's trying to tell us that is that the find operation that's defined on a set knows it's working with a set and therefore it can use binary search to find it in login time. Conversely, the algorithm that implements find doesn't know that it's working on a set. It, it just knows it's working on an integer range. So if you take a look over here, you'll see that this is just calling good old find if. And find if, as we know from previous discussions, just does a linear search. So this is going to be a linear search, whereas the one up here that does the find that's a member of the class or the container will be a binary search. And so as a consequence, the compiler is trying to tell us, hey, use the faster version, please. And if it doesn't matter, you probably should use the faster version. In this case, I was just using it to demonstrate the point. This time now, when we get an iterator back, it will in fact be not equal to the end of the, the iterator range because we will have found the item because we just put it in there. So the last thing we do here is we go ahead and start at the beginning of the set and go to the end of the set and we print every one of the elements out. And you'll see that it'll come back in descending order. So if you take a look at the code, you can see that we come in here, we look up nine, don't find it. We insert nine, now we have six elements in the set. And then we go ahead and find nine, which will be there now. And then we print the results and it'll come back nine, seven, three, two, one, zero. Sounds like we're about ready to blast off. I guess for, for kicks, I probably should do this at the beginning. So you can see that we start out with five elements and then we go ahead and do the insertions, the insertion, and then we end up with uh, six elements in the set. Okay, so that's the first example. And I think you'll agree that uh, sets are much more interesting in a lot of ways than the sequential containers we've talked about so far. They have much more interesting properties and uh, we'll see that as we go through some other examples. So speaking about other examples, here's an example that demonstrates how set insert works. And it's really pretty cool. So in this case, we're just gonna make a set that defaults to using the less functor, less int. And of course, if you know, if I was really wanted to be belt and suspenders, I could do this, I could say that, um, or I could say this, uh, or the compiler, if I do this, the compiler says, hey, what are you doing? It, it already defaults to that. So, uh, you know, why are you having to put this in here? It's, it's a belt and suspenders code coding, belt and suspenders coding, it's, it's too much redundancy. So let's just keep it simple. What we're then gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and insert into the set, the values 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. So those will be inserted. And then we're gonna go ahead and try to reinsert element 20. So when we call element 20, it's gonna give us back a pair. Once again, we get to use our pair class. And so in this case, the pair that comes back from insert will be an iterator and a bool. And let's go ahead and just for kicks, let's go ahead and have it replace this with an actual type. So you can see that we get back a pair set int iterator. All right, so that's what we're getting underneath the hood. Now, as you can see, the second value there is a Boolean. So it's another good example of a pair that has two different types. And that Boolean indicates whether or not the item has was inserted. So of course the item was already there, so it's not going to be inserted. So second will be false. So what we do in that case is we check to see if second is false, which it, it better well be. And then in that case, we're gonna go ahead and take the iterator that came back as the first result returned from, from the uh, insert operation. No matter whether or not the second bool value is true or false, the first value to pair will always be an iterator to the item, because either we put it in there, in which case the Boolean is true, or we didn't put it in there, in which case the Boolean is false, but we still get back the iterator for the item that we found in the set. So now we're gonna go ahead and have an iterator that points to element 20. And think about what's going on under the hood. Under the hood, this is implemented as a red black tree. So this iterator is actually pointing into a node in that tree. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these insert optimization methods. So we have insert that takes an iterator. So what it's gonna do there is if you give it an iterator and the insert operation can determine with 
just a quick check that this item is a child of the one that we've currently got. So like if you have 20 and you give it 25 and 24, it'll say, aha, I know where to put these. And so it can quickly insert them into the tree and rebalance it without having to start at the top and search down. So those are basically what we call insert optimization methods. And they're optimized by passing in the iterator as a hint. But if it has to do more than just kind of look to the left or look to the right to decide where the item goes, like if you put a 26 in there, at that case, it would have to do several hops down to find where that goes. At that point, the insert optimization method throws up its hands and says, let's just start from the top. And so it does a full insert from the, the root of the tree. But still, if you, if you play your cards right and you know something about how your data structure is organized, you can actually do essentially linear time insertions into the set by using the iterator to keep track of where you just did the previous insertion. So that's pretty cool. Something else you can do with the set is you can actually insert a group of elements or what's called an initializer list all in one fell swoop. So in this case, we're gonna take five, 10 and 15 and try to insert them. Well, as you can imagine, uh, five and 15 will be inserted, but 10 was already there. So it's going to be ignored. And uh, you can see that this particular method does not return um, anything that will be of really of use to us because it, it's inserting multiple things. They probably should have had it return, I don't know, a vector of pairs or something like that so you could know what was inserted and what wasn't. So then what happens is we go through the set from beginning to end and we print the results out. So let's go ahead and run this code and we'll see what we get as the output. So you can see we started out with the set having 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. We tried to add 20, of course, it was already there. We added 24, 25, 26. You can see that they show up in order. And then we went and added, tried to re-add uh, 10 along with five and 15. And so of course it adds five and 15 and, and skips 10 because 10 was already there. So that's another set of discussions about set and it's really focusing on the semantics of insert and showing you how you get back a pair that tells you whether the item was already there or not. All right, so let's continue on. And now we're gonna talk about yet another example. So there's lots of fun examples with sets. This particular example is going to give us um, some illustrations of how to use the swap algorithm in conjunction with sets. Now you should be familiar with swap by now because that's what we've been using to write our trivially exception safe code or strongly exception safe code, especially for the assignment operator without having to put try catch blocks into our, into our implementation, which is really cool. So here we're gonna go ahead and make ourselves a first set, which has these values. And of course they'll be ordered once they're inserted. And then just for kicks, we give ourselves a reference to the second set. So this actually won't make any kind of deep copy at all. It just gives us a reference to the second set. And then we use the reference to the second set, which of course is referencing the first set, to create a list. So now we have a list that contains the contents of the second set, which is a reference to the first set. And that will then also of course be ordered. So the list will also be ordered. Now we go ahead and use the list in order to make a third set. Excuse me. But this third set is going to end up being ordered in reverse order by using greater as opposed to using less, which is the default. So now we're gonna have a set with the same values as the first set, but it's gonna be rearranged in reverse order. And now we're gonna create a fourth set, which starts out empty. And then we're gonna go ahead and swap the contents of the first set with the fourth set. And so uh, what we should also do when we do that is we should say um, uh, assert, first set is empty. Okay, whoops, um, not is empty, empty. <laughs> and let's go ahead and get the insert operation, import macro, and we grab this guy, there we go. So this, this should hopefully check to make sure that when we did this swap that we really uh, completely the bottomized first set um, because four sets started out empty. So we'll, we'll see whether or not that blows up. What we do now is we take the contents of third set, which is going to be the reverse of first set, the original contents of first set, 
and we're going to go ahead and copy the fourth set, which is going to have the original contents of first set before we swapped it. And we'll go ahead and print all that out. So let's take a look and see what we get. And voila, our assert did not blow up, so that's a good, good sign. And you can see that the results are basically the values that were inserted into the first set in reverse order because the uh, third set was using greater. We initialized it with the greater functor from our list. And then fourth set ended up with first set, and first set, of course, was using the less operation. So just kind of demonstrating some other interesting use cases. Uh, this is yet another way to do swap. My typical way of using swap is for doing exception safe copy constructors and other exception safe operations. This technique is probably less used, but it's also worth knowing how you can use these capabilities on arbitrary containers to swap their contents. So if you take a, a look, the only way to add a new element to a set or a multi-set after you initialize it, using the constructor, of course, is to insert a value using the insert member function. And as we saw before, the insert method returns a pair of values where the first, the first field in the pair is going to contain the iterator, which we'll always find, and the second field contains a Boolean value that's true if the element was in fact inserted when we inserted it here, and false if it was already there. So obviously in a, a set, you will get back false if you try to insert something more than once. With a multi-set, of course, if you try to insert something more than once, you won't get back false because it's perfectly legitimate, perfectly legal to ins insert multiple keys with the same value into a multi-set. So we're gonna show just a little example of how to, how to use the output for various effects. And, and this is just kind of illustrating the fact you can chain together these calls because of the the value semantics of C++. So here you can see we have first set, which will be, we don't really care that it's ordered in ascending order because we only could put one value in it, but it's ordered in ascending order. And we go ahead and insert 55 into the first set. And then we come down here and we say, first set dot insert 55. So this is the second time we've tried to put 55 in here. And you can see that what'll happen there is we say first set dot insert dot second, which is that Boolean field that indicates whether or not we succeeded. And of course, it will fail. So we'll say element was not reinserted. Um, and so let's run that and I'll show you that that's indeed what it does. Element was not reinserted, which makes sense. But now just for kicks, this is gonna be a little bit of um, kind of a precursor of what's to come. Um, you can see that with the multi-set approach, things are gonna be different. And so we'll take a look at how insert works for there because of course it does allow duplicates. So there's no need for it to return a pair. So we'll, we'll take a look at that when we talk about multi-set. So you never have to worry about checking for duplicate insertions with a multi-set because it'll always succeed. So they deliberately change the insert method ever so slightly because it doesn't need to check to see if it was already there. So we're now gonna talk about sets and multi-sets, primarily sets, and discuss the begin and end factory methods that produce iterators. So these, let's call these things factory methods because that's what they are. And the iterators that are produced by these functions are, are const or constant, which means that the keys can't be changed. For all the reasons we've talked about before, you do not want to allow the values, the keys to be changed. Otherwise, insanity and, and chaos will ensue. And then there's also a pair of factory methods, rbegin and rn, which give you reverse iterators. And then something else we're gonna see here is how to remove elements from a set using the erase method. And erase will, of course, uh, get rid of the element. And there's several different ways you can erase things. You can erase it by value, you can erase it by iterator, and you can also erase an iterator range. And so we're gonna take a look at all those different features. So here's our, our set. Let's make it a set of ints to start out with. And then we go ahead and print the contents. Should be no real surprise there. And now we're gonna go ahead and erase the element whose value is four. So four is off the show, get rid of it. And then we come down here and we find element five, which we should find because it'll be there. And we get back uh, an iterator. And notice that we can't assign to that 
iterator. Because as we'll see when we hover over here, it says can't assign to return value because function operator returns a const value, which in fact it should, because that's the rules for, uh, for sets. What we're going to do, however, even though we can't change the value, we can always come along here and we can erase the value via the iterator. So we say first set dot erase five. So we zap the five. And then we're going to go ahead and copy the contents of the set in reverse order to the output stream. And then just to uh, for completeness, we're going to go ahead and get ourselves an iterator to the value six and an iterator to the value eight. And then we're going to erase from iterator six up to, but not including eight. So basically what we're going to do there is we're going to go ahead and get rid of the values six and seven, but leave eight. So that's how you can erase a range. And then the final thing we're going to do is we're going to print the elements in reverse order by using copy with R begin and R end. So this is kind of a tour de force of all kinds of cool STL like things to demonstrate in this example. So you can see here, we started out with the values in the set being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then we got rid of four and we got rid of five and we printed those values. And then we went ahead and we erased from six up to, but not including eight via their iterators using an iterator range. And that of course gets rid of values six and seven. And then we print everything in reverse order. So we get eight, three, two, one, and we're done. <laughs> so uh, that's demonstrating yet another way of doing things with sets.